here he comes now. Alice, you've just finished your final rehearsal for your headline appearance at the Reading Festival yeah. tomorrow night. As we can see, the road crew are taking down the stage. Fresh blood. Fresh blood on the guillotine. Yeah. Drum kit's still there. The guillotine will be the last to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> I take this back to the hotel with me. Right. In a way, it's quite symbolic, because I understand that, that at Reading, it's going to be the last time we're going to see this particular stage This show. will be the, the last uh, performance of, uh, of The Nightmare Returns. And uh, we did over 120 shows of this. Actually, we did about 15 shows here in England, which was great, last uh, winter. And um, this will be the last production of this, and then we're going to go into a new production starting September, October. Right. So I, I presume the new production ties in with the forthcoming album you've yes, got. Yes. It's called Raise Your Fist and Yell, Raise isn't Your it? Fist and Yell, and it's... Uh, to me, it's it's the most exciting album we've ever had out. I think you know it's it's got everything that I wanted to hear in 1988. You know, <laughs> and we give Kane a lot more room to play on this one, and we, and we give Ken Mary a lot more room on drums and everything. And well, I would say it's definitely a heavier sounding album, but a richer sounding album as well than your I last Constrictor. So. Yeah, I think so. Constrictor was kind of like we almost looked at Constrictor as our first album. You know, because the the 18 albums before that or 17 albums before that were sort of like. That's in another era, as far as I'm concerned. So we're starting all over. Constrictor was number one. This is like the second album. As far Would you as say that it's a heavy metal album as such, or is it slightly different? I'd say it's metal-ish. I think we, we tried to get the best parts of metal. But for me, the, the, most, the, the best part of metal is the energy and the sound. Uh, the sound of the guitars, sound of the drums, all working together. Um, I think where, where metal misses is that too many bands try to sound the same. Everybody's trying to sound like Ronnie Dio. It's a great, yeah, great yeah. operatic kind of thing. Yeah. It's great for Ronnie Dio, yeah. but I mean, just too many bands try to copy that. So you have a lot of bands sounding the same. I think we took the best part of that kind of sound and, uh, and took that voice out and put Alice's voice in and with my kind of lyrics. You've certainly taken the energy from heavy metal. Absolutely. And there aren't yeah. really any ballads on the album, are well, there? Not such. Yes, there's a track called Gale. That's Gale, right. which will never <laughs> get played on the radio because it's really sick. I mean, I, I admit it, it's really sick, but I like it. Gale comes towards the end of side two, and the whole album really builds up on side two. It's like a sort of a splatter movie put to music, isn't Part it? Part two, yeah. Side two is actually a whole splatter scene. It's about a guy that watches so many splatter movies, it's kind of autobiographical, <laughs> that he doesn't know where his life begins and where the movie ends, and where, you know they're both interchangeable. And so all these characters that he keeps finding dead are named Gale. And uh, he can't figure out why. He doesn't know if they're characters or if they're real victims. So, I mean, it's, it's really an interesting uh, sort of psychodrama. I think as part of that scenario, there's a very subtle little ditty called Chop, Chop, Chop. Chop, well, Chop, Chop is, is a very subtle little <laughs> thing that I'm very proud of. <laughs> it's kind of self-explanatory. That's true. Also on site, there's another track called Prince of Darkness. Yes. Now, I understand that you're also going to be appearing in a John Carpenter film called Prince, Prince of, of Darkness. Darkness. So right. is therefore that track going to be in the film it as well? It will be in the film. And, uh, and the, uh, the part I play in that is... Uh, I mean, John Carpenter is one of my heroes, mm. you know, since Halloween and The Thing and all the, all the great films he's done. And uh, I actually just went down to the set to watch him film it. Oh, really? He stuck me in the movie and then he expanded the part, uh, you know. Oh, so I, I, actually, I actually do uh, wipe a few people out in the movie. How That's many good. people do you kill in this one? Well, I, can't, I think as it is right now, just one. Because I think in the film Monster Dog, he killed about seven or eight, wasn't it? Seven or eight, yeah. yeah. Which is not bad going. No, but this is a real spectacular one, though. <laughs> this is a... This has got a lot of, this is a very tasteful kind of... Right. Well, you mentioned the film is called Prince of Darkness. I imagine in some parts of America, people probably think you are the Prince of Darkness. Yeah, it's so funny, you know, because none of the... It's like nobody's into Satan worship. Nobody's into that kind of thing at all. I think the context of the movie is the fact that, that uh, the movie is, uh, has something to do with them having the devil trapped. Mm. But uh, no, I'm not the Prince of Darkness. I'm probably the... Especially not the Prince. The, the king of horror. <laughs> there is also quite a lot of humour in the stuff you're doing. If people listen close to the lyrics, some of them are actually quite funny as well. Oh, I think so. I, I, I don't think it would be worth doing if it didn't have a humour involved in it. Uh, most of the horror movies that I rent, I go out and rent five or six a day, and most of them are very funny. Mm. I mean, Evil Dead, I just saw Evil Dead Part 2. Oh, right, yeah. Laughed my, I was laughing so hard because <laughs> it went so past the right. point of, of absurdity. Uh, it just, I mean, it just, if you watch part one and two together, it's just too much to watch it, you know, at one sitting. But I, but I thought it was very funny. I don't know, people could take that seriously, but I, I can't see how they could take those movies seriously. That's true. A lot of horror films are quite funny, but what sort of things do you find genuinely frightening? 
Well, I found, I, as far as movies go, there's a couple of films I found scary. I thought the Suspiria was scary. Mm. And I thought The Exorcist was scary. Yeah. And I even thought of, oh, there was a movie called In Cold Blood. I thought that was, that was scary. Truman Capote. It was a real story. Uh, the news is scary. The was guy, the guy that does the interior decorating at Holiday Inn is scary. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of scary people out there. I was, I was thinking, do you think you'd be frightened by the prospect of working in an office doing a normal nine-to-five job? That would be scary. That would be horrifying to me. Uh, I don't think I could ever do that. Well, there's a track on the album, the opening track, called Freedom. Yes. Talking about not working in offices. Um, yeah. That's going to be the first single, isn't it, I think, from the yes, record? Yes, I think that is. And it's also a little message to uh, the PMRC, you know, talking about, you know, who are they? I mean, really. I didn't elect them to, to be my mom and dad. Mm. I didn't elect them to be my authority. They, you know, who are they? So, I mean, I don't really... I see this great big sort of authority finger going like this. And, and they start out with the premise that every kid in the United States and every kid in England is stupid. That's the first premise they start out with, that every kid is too stupid to know what to listen to. Personally, I think that that's really a pretty arrogant attitude, you know. Uh, I think the kids are a lot smarter than that, especially about rock music. It's their music. What does some, you know, 40-year-old, 45-year-old woman know about rock music? Well, very little, I suspect. They seem to be trying to ban rock music altogether. That's what they yeah, like, well, it seems. I mean, you know, it's a lot of smoke. You know, I think there are a lot of smoke. But that's always been the way with rock. Since Elvis Presley's day, there's oh, always listen, been people we, putting it down. We never had so much problem. The last tour, I've never had so much problem with authority figures. Really? Uh, all the way through the South, especially. I mean, they were going to literally lynch us down there, which was made me think that well, we're on the right track. <laughs> you know? Were there any things in the show you had to change to play in the South, or did never. you keep it as it was? You never changed a thing. And, uh, I mean, you know, what can they do? I mean, you've seen the show. Mm. There's, there's really nothing in it that, that's illegal. Mm. You know, there's a lot of suggestive things in it. But uh, everybody that's at the concert, I mean, are having such a good time. I don't think any, I think it'd be crazy to try to stop the, the show. Mm. You know? I just think it's a lot of people that are looking for something to do. <laughs> Probably. So they figure, yeah. Well, you know, you let's, let's pick on Alice, but I don't care, that's fine with me. Well, you mentioned you're going to be changing the show. Does that mean we're going to be losing the guillotine now? Yeah, but we'll replace it with something worse. <laughs> you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even get rid of it unless I could put something worse in its place. Because it's a real trademark as far as Alice Cooper's yeah, concerned. Yeah, uh, I think the next thing will be probably a lot bloodier than this. Have you worked out the next stage already? Yeah, we started working on it already. In fact, they started building the new props about two months ago, because right. a lot of them are, are pretty, uh, you know, time-consuming as far as putting been, them together. You've been using something like the guillotine for 10 years now, but I imagine... Guillotine and, uh, and a lot of different things, electric electric chairs and right. hanging and stuff like that. So will, any, will any of that be coming back, do you mm, think? I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you anyways. I couldn't tell <laughs> Not you. Not going to tell me. <laughs> but I imagine these days, with more sophisticated special effects, you can let your imagination run riot even more than you could 10 years ago. Well, even in this show, uh, the Teenage Frankenstein and the Impaling and things like that are all, are all things that we got from... We went right to the source, you mm. know, to the movie people and said, how do I do this? And how do I make this thing work? And how, does it, how, how do I get it to work? And they can technically tell you how to do it, and they'll build it for you and, and work it all out. You have to come up with the idea first and then and how to work it into the show and make it look like it belongs in the show. Hmm. Uh, I know all the people who've seen your show keep saying, how does he do the thing with the teenage Frankenstein? Obviously, you're not going to tell me no, how you do that, no. but it is, a, it is an, an amazing effect. Yeah. Plus, you've got it out on video. The whole show's on video. You can actually freeze frame it and, it still and, still try, and you still can't tell yeah, how it's done. Uh, that's what makes it a good effect. <laughs> you know, the thing that makes it... Uh, also work is the fact that it's not set up like a magic show. If we had, went up there and said, okay, now we're going to do this, you know, and the girl comes out and puts a hoop through it. But what happens is they're not expecting it. Uh, the show will be rocking right along, and then all of a sudden, Alice will, will do it. He, says, he killed the guy. I mean, he didn't just throw him off the stage. He put a mic stand through him, you know. And, uh, and so a lot of the things are, are built on setting the audience up, you know. And, uh, and, the, and the illusion will happen in... in within the show, so it's not being expected, you know. When you're thinking about ideas for a new stage show, are there any boundaries you wouldn't cross over and say, that's just too bad taste, I couldn't possibly do that? Well, I'm not, ne not necessarily bad taste, but it has, to, uh, it has to work every night, for one thing. It has to be a general thing. It can't be like a, uh, a if you're gonna make fun of something that happened in the news, and then five months later, 
you're on, still on tour, people are going to forget what happened in the news, and then the, the joke is gone, or the, the point is, is not taken anymore. Um, I think that we stay pretty much to a basic horror pattern, you know, of what, how we set things up. The same thing with the snake. The snake is a general horror image. And I think that the stage show is a general horror image. We stay in that realm. You know, like we don't really do anything religious at all. We don't do anything political, you know. Because I think politics is boring. Just boring as hell. Let you two do the politics, you know. I mean, certain bands are good at that. Uh, we, we find that a little bit boring. You, know? you mentioned about using horror imagery. And one of my favorite Alice Cooper songs was The Black Widow. Track, yes. which Vincent Price had that could show up again. Because I thought that was great. You never know. Yeah. That, some, some songs could show up again because yeah, no matter what we do, we always end up doing about 70% of the older stuff because the audience demands it. And, uh, and if, I think if we went out and did all the songs of Constrictor and you raise your fist and yell, the audience would be screaming for some of the standards, you know. And so, I mean, we really do have to do almost more than 50% oldies. Well, we've already mentioned that the new album's out in October. Is that when you're going to come back to Europe and play some more shows? We'll be year? doing the States October, November, December, January, and probably over here February, March. That's, what, that's the plan right now. You know, maybe we could avoid cold weather again. This is the <laughs> nicest weather. This is the best weather we've been, I've ever been in in England. I think you're going to be very lucky. I hope so. Maybe, maybe when you get on stage, there'll be thunderstorms. There'll be a lightning exactly. storm. That would be great. And then they'll say, how did Alice ever plan that? <laughs> Good luck, Alice. Thanks, Thanks, thanks Dante. Thanks. 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 Come on, Dad. I'm trying to make a good impression. It's a lovely night. Walking in the moonlight is very romantic. Trust. Got the record deal, I guess it was about six months into Alice's tour. And it was a real easy thing. The first um, record company I went to, MCA, just jumped right on it. So it was painless enough for me to do, and we're real excited about it. I mean, I, I kind of torn between the two because I ended up really loving both projects. So. But I'm excited about it, yeah. I think the album's going to be called Simply Kane Roberts, but yes. there is actually a band called Criminal Justice involved. The band there? was called Criminal Justice for quite a while, actually. We were together about five years, and we were banging it out in all those uh, little bars that everybody kind of learns their trade in, you know? So uh, it's, three, it's three guys. It's me, uh, Steve Steele on bass, and Victor Russo on drums, yeah. And you're also singing the lead vocals. I on sing the album, lead aren't vocals, you? yeah. Which is something you don't really get a chance to do with Alice. So it's no, no. I, I, with Alice, it's kind of a luxury. I just said I want to strap on the guitar and just, uh, just play. You know, it's a lot of fun to do that. And I, I let Alice do all this singing. You ever thought about trying to persuade him to let you sing during the show? Well, be a good I idea. might, I might sing backgrounds, but I don't want to. I don't want to sing only women bleed or anything. If that's what you mean. <laughs> when this album comes out, a lot of people might say, "Oh, Kane Roberts has left Alice Cooper. He's got his own band now." How would you answer that? Um, I'd say that Alice, uh, there's very few people that I would want to play with anyway. And Alice and I hit it off so well that uh, we're going to stick together until it doesn't make sense anymore. But uh, like I say, we don't, we, we don't expect either project to uh, suffer as a result of the success of either things. You know what I mean? I, I think if everything stays positive, we're going to be happy with it. So. But if your album is a big success, wouldn't mm -hmm. there be pressure on you to go out and play some shows with your own band? I'm out of there. No, no. <laughs> what we'll probably do is uh, where there's some talk of having me open for Alice and then play with Alice. And it's funny because a lot of people then say, isn't that a lot of work? But mm -hmm. I'm fresh out of those bars where I had to play six sets, you know, and 200 people. And the only window is a little beer sign, you know. So this is, this is cake for me. This is fun. If I remember, wasn't there talk of you doing that on Alice Cooper's last American tour, opening with your own band and then going on and playing with him? Yeah, afterwards? but we decided, to, uh, we decided to postpone that and just concentrate on what we were doing with Alice and let the uh, record take its uh, natural course, you know. Okay. Well, people watching this may not have heard either the new Alice Cooper album or your album. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the two? How, how would you say your album differs from Alice's stuff? Um, I would say that uh, y y you're not going to listen to my record and hear a lot of Alice Cooper influence. You'll notice some of the uh, different stylistic things because we've matched up. Uh, this new album, Alice and I really have hit our stride writing-wise, and we're, we're trying to capture what was going on earlier in Alice's career. I think uh, my, my album is, uh, if I was going to name any uh, influences, it would have to be somewhere between Def Leppard and Van Halen. So, I was reading your biography the other day. And you no, as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and you're mentioned in the bio as well. I noticed you in there. Mm -hmm. And it said that the songs focus on a mixture of sex and power. Is that mm -hmm. a good way of describing it? Yeah, I was, it's because a lot of people ask me a few questions. They say, "Who am I influenced by on guitar?" and "Why did I decide to get big?" For me, I, I just let my life influence me as much as I can outside of the, my favorite guitar players. And if, as far as my size, it's, it's kind of a flesh and blood version of what I feel about rock and roll. And I think the two greatest things about that is what it has to say about sex and power. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I don't think we'll talk about sex, but you're obviously a very powerful person. Do you mm -hmm. train every day? I train about six days a week. Uh, it's it's kind of not like other people. The, the gym that I train at in California, um, there's no mirrors or anything, and it's it's a bunch of uh, guys and a bunch of women that are just they're closer to animals than they are human <laughs> beings. So we just go in there and bang the weights out, and we just have a good time. Yeah. When people see you, they probably think, oh. That guy can't play guitar, he must be very clumsy, so mm -hmm. big. Yeah, I had a little, I remember I worked on Rod Stewart's last album. He's one of those guys that I listened to as a kid, and I was freaked out that I had an opportunity to play. And the first time he saw me, he was really scratching his head, you know. And then we, we hit it off real well, I ended up doing a lot of work on the record, so. I think when people hear you play, they're probably converted after that. Yeah, I, I think and basically. You can always pick them up, can't you? Well, <laughs> in, in terms of, in terms of uh, the size and playing, I think my greatest advantage is no one tells me to turn down anymore, so. <laughs> That's right. Do you have to, to eat special food and, and drink certain drinks? Yeah, I just eat a lot of food. Just, <laughs> my, my food bills on tour are at least 1000 a week, $700, $1,000, really? sometimes more, yeah. I mean, do you have to look my, after yourself? My per diem is like gone for breakfast, so I don't even... Do you have to look after yourself and not really enjoy the rock and roll lifestyle as much as you might? No. I, I would say that that's not true. I would say I enjoy those little benefits. That's why I'm here, you know, so... For me, it's a natural thing. I mean, if you see some guys training at the gym, you'd say, boy, those guys are really, de they're real dedicated, you know? And you, you see me train and you might think, uh, you know, I wonder how he got so big. I just, I just took to it, you know? And I just, it's an inspirational thing. If I feel like really chugging at the weights, I do it. But I try not to let it interfere with my life, you know, so. We've had some rock stars, people like David Lee Roth and Stephen Pearcey appearing in the, the pages of Playgirl magazine. Have mm -hmm. you been approached to do that as yet? Uh, no. No. How would you feel about doing something like that? Um, I don't know. I, it would be kind of a, an unusual thing. Uh, what do you do in those? You, you... I don't think you take all your clothes. Have you take quite a lot of them off and strike certain I think I would take poses. one article of clothing off. They'd have to pick whatever it was. So <laughs> My biggest part, whatever that yeah. took me. Yeah. What about future albums outside of Alice Cooper? Is that going to be a possibility too? Um, yeah, we're supposed to start my next record somewhere uh, late spring. So as far as working with other artists, uh, it, it's really tough. Uh, you know, I, somebody said this, and I really uh, rung a bell with me. Is I really don't like washing dishes for too many people. You know, I like to just do it for myself or like close friends. You know, and Alice is now a friend, so we get along enough. And, and it's I don't want to like start playing on the In Excess's album in this band because I'm not. I don't feel all those styles. You know, it's just whatever I, I look at as a real opportunity is what I go for. Oh, thank you, Kane. Good luck with your yeah. album and the Alice Cooper album, too. All right, thanks a lot. My